Speakers, we're going to have Fortune Minerals first. So I'll invite Robin Goad, President and CEO. Fortune is a TSX listed development mining company. It's focused on development of its wholly owned, vertically integrated NECO cobalt gold bismuth copper project in Canada. It's comprised of a, prop a proposed mine and a concentrator in Northwest Territories and a refinery in Saskatchewan. Robin, please. Thank you, Anthony, and uh, thank you to the Government of Canada and also to the Northern Miner for, uh, for holding this conference. I'd also like to uh, uh, briefly acknowledge the Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment from the Northwest Territories is uh, here today, and thank you, uh, Minister Wally Schumann, for also attending. So we're going to talk today about, uh, about batteries and, uh, and the battery materials. And I'm in the enviable position right now that I have to actually be contrarian to, uh, to Pierre Lassand. I've uh, <laughs> earlier today said that electric cars were not going to happen in this, uh, in this uh, generation. I, I beg to differ. In fact, I think it's happening faster and faster than anybody can realize. Uh, Pierre's betting against governments, against, against the entire automotive industry and, and also a lot of other industries, including technology. So. Um, Fortune Minerals is, uh, is a participant in the value chain for, uh, uh, for battery metals. We are a development stage cobalt asset located in Canada with uh, a vertically integrated project that produces battery materials. Cobalt is essentially the bottleneck in, uh, in electric uh, uh, automobile transformation which is happening. And uh, also uh, this is a project that will be able to demonstrate supply chain transparency of ethically procured Canadian cobalt in, uh, for this rapidly expanding lithium-ion battery industry and to, to fuel transformation of the automotive uh, electrification that's transpiring right now. So uh, we do have uh, forward-looking information. I'm sure you've all caught that. We're, uh, we're listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol FT. We also trade on the OTCQX in the United States under the symbol FTMDF. We're about a $100 million company. Uh, we're, uh, we're covered by a couple of, uh, of investment bankers in Canada, and, uh, and essentially we have about eight, $9 million in cash. So what I'm going to talk about today is the NICO development. It's a, uh, it's a very interesting project. It's a 25-year instant success. It's, uh, and that's a very key thing to understand. We're going through this transformation in, in electrification and it takes typically 10 years to 20 years to develop a mineral deposit today. And uh, therefore, we have bottlenecks in certain, um, in certain materials, and it's going to be a challenge to be able to set, uh, satisfy the, the gr demand growth that's happening in certain commodities, particularly cobalt, because it just takes that long to develop a mineral deposit. And this is one of the very few shovel-ready developments globally located outside of the DRC or the not-so-democratic Republic of the Congo. Yesterday, um, there was uh, an announcement that Jacamin is, uh, is actually going to try and uh, fleece uh, Katanga Mining out of, their, uh, out of their licenses. This is not a, uh, an uncommon phenomena in the DRC, and to have a Canadian uh, source of supply is, is very powerful uh, for what's happening in this, uh, in this sector. So this is a 100% owned asset. It's primary cobalt. That means cobalt is responsible for most of the revenues. It also has over a million ounces of gold in its mineral reserves. It, owns, uh, it has 12% of the global bismuth reserves globally. $125 million Canadian has already been invested in this project. We have a macro of expanding uh, cobalt demand and supply chain concerns with the current sources of supply. Vertically integrated project including a mine and concentrator which will be situated in the Northwest Territories near Yellowknife and a refinery located in, in Saskatoon where we'll process those concentrates to value-added chemicals needed in the battery industry. Uh, this project's already been subjected to feed engineering, 2014 feasibility study, identifying 33 million tons of reserves. That's a 21-year mine life at 4,650 tons per day. But we have a new feasibility study in preparation which will be finished in June. That study is being done by Hatch Engineering uh, p and &E Mining Consultants and Micon International, which is evaluating a 30% expansion to 6,000 tons per day, and this feasibility study, as I say, will be completed in June. 
The reserves will be higher, the, uh, and the economies of scale will be benefiting uh, a project with lower uh, operating costs and a significantly expanded project. We have received environmental assessment approval for the mine and the concentrator in the Northwest Territories, the major mine permits in the Northwest Territories, and we've received the EA approval in, Sus in Saskatoon. There's only one outstanding permit, and that's a zoning change in Saskatchewan, and that's now currently underway. The, uh, uh, we are, again, going to be a Canadian primary cobalt independent of the Congo, independent of China processing, independent of copper and nickel mining, and with a proven management team that have uh, proven records in identifying, developing, building, and operating projects in the Northwest Territories. So the project products that we're going to produce are uh, firstly uh, cobalt sulfate heptahydrate, and that is our sulfate that's uh, shown in that, uh, that picture. It was produced in our pilot plant, and it meets the battery specifications of, uh, of the battery industry today. We'll also produce gold dore, a copper cement product, bismuth ingot, needles, and an oxide, and we'll explain the use of all of these metals uh, coming. I've got the 2014 feasibility study production numbers identified on this slide, but considering that we're, uh, we're accommodating a 30% expansion in production, you can roughly scale up the numbers, and the cobalt production will be roughly 1,800 tons over a 20-year reserve, and about 2,000 tons in the early years of production. Let's talk a little bit about the cobalt market. It's uh, now about, uh, about 120,000 tons per year of mine production, 105,000 tons of refined metal output, and about 67% of that is currently sourced in the not-so-democratic Republic of the Congo, as we talked about. 60% of the refining is done in China, and 80% of the cobalt chemical supply is done in China. These are very serious supply chain concerns for uh, the automotive industry, which are, is a global phenomenon, and sourcing the raw materials are going to be required. 98% of non-artisanal production is currently sourced as a byproduct of either copper or nickel, where copper and nickel determine the production criteria, and I'll explain some of the, uh, the risks associated with that shortly. Responsible sourcing has become an issue. Amnesty International, a couple of years ago, uh, put out a report which uh, was highly critical of some of the artisanal production that was coming out of the DRC, as well as identifying conflict minerals. So having a uh, source of supply again in Canada is very important for electronics companies and automotive companies that are concerned about their brand. The, um, we've had increasing demand uh, for cobalt consumption at a rate of about 6% over the last two decades. And that's up from, uh, battery use is up from 1% of, uh, of a much smaller market 20 years ago to 53% of the current market. It's important to recognize that this growth in the battery market has happened on the back of small portable electronic devices, and we're about to go into a step change into automotive electrification where significant additional demand is going to be required. And cobalt is the bottleneck in uh, the battery industry. So just uh, quickly on uh, uh, how is cobalt used in batteries? It's uh, primarily used in the cathodes of, uh, of many different rechargeable battery types. And you see energy density being plotted here in the histograms from the evolution from lead acid batteries to NiCad batteries to nickel metal hydrate batteries and into lithium ion batteries. The batteries that contain cobalt are identified in the blue histograms. And in particular, the new lithium ion batteries, there are six major cathode chemistries that are identified here. The most important ones contain cobalt, including LCO batteries or lithium cobalt oxide used in your portable electronic devices. NCA, which is nickel cobalt aluminum, is the cathode chemistry used in a Tesla automobile. And most of the other electric vehicles use NMC or nickel manganese cobalt. These batteries typically contain anywhere from five to, uh, to about 30% cobalt by weight. An LCO battery contains 60% cobalt by weight. You cannot get volumetric energy density to have a nice thin cell phone without using LCO battery chemistry. But whereas a battery in a cell phone may contain five to 20 grams of cobalt by weight, uh, the um, electric vehicles can, are going to require anywhere from 4,000 to 30,000 grams, up to 30 kilograms of cobalt per EV in a Model S uh, Tesla. So clearly we're going to require significant additional cobalt. This is just a little bit of, uh, of um, 
explanation of how the batteries are, are, are basically evolving right now. There are 33 battery mega factories under construction or announced around the world right now. 15 of those are in China. We're all very familiar with the Tesla Gigafactory in Nevada, which is a $5 billion joint venture with, uh, um, with Panasonic. But a battery factory in China uh, owned by CATL is going to be significantly larger. It'll be 50 to 100 uh, gigawatts of battery output in comparison to 35 gigawatts for the Tesla. Now, Tesla is now at full production with approximately uh, 7,000 tons of cobalt consumption per year. The CATL facility will require 23,000 tons. So these two battery factories alone, 25,000, well, will be uh, 30,000 tons of cobalt consumption or 25% of the global demand of, uh, of production of, of cobalt just in two factories. And this is uh, about to radically change in 2020 when we have this step change in proliferation of automotive electrification. And this is transformative. It's, uh, it, you're seeing convergence of technology companies, automotive companies, energy companies, all trying to get uh, into this game. For example, even uh, uh, Total Petroleum has uh, been investing in batteries. So it's, uh, this is indeed happening. If we look at penetration rates that are being forecast by different automotive companies, all of the German companies, for example, are projecting that 25% of all cars built in only seven years' time from now will be electric or hybrid, which means we're going to have enormous penetration rates happening very, very quickly. This is a, a chart that I've, um, I've actually absconded from uh, CRU. And what it does is it demonstrates the problem with uh, sourcing cobalt as a byproduct of either copper or nickel mining. So for example, if we were to source the conservative estimates of cobalt demand by 2025 from copper cobalt type deposits that we see in the African copper belt, we would have to double that copper consumption uh, production. It's obviously not going to happen because you would cannibalize the market for the primary metal. And if we do the similar analysis for nickel, you'd have to quintuple it. So uh, clearly, we need primary deposits. NICO is one of three um, primary cobalt deposits currently recognized globally. Two of them are uh, development projects in North America, one in production currently in Morocco. Oh, by the way, I, I also commented on recycling. Recycling is clearly where we're going to have to go to in the future. But the material for recycling is not going to be available for probably a decade or so. And that's simply because the collection points, firstly, aren't established. Secondly, an EV battery lasts about 8 to 10 years. And it also has 80% of its useful life after its completion in an electric vehicle use and will probably have a secondary usage in stationary storage. But even with just a decade of electric vehicle uh, use in, in the battery, you're not going to have the batteries available for recycling for quite some time. So we need new deposits, and we need them fast. Oh, I um, <laughs> almost forgot this slide. Uh, this is uh, just a slide showing cobalt price. It's quite volatile. Um, it uh, typically ranges anywhere from 10 to about, uh, well, it's been as high as $60 a pound. On an inflation-adjusted basis, it's $25 per pound is the average price over the last 20 years. And, uh, but what we're seeing in those previous peaks of, sp of, of um, price spikes is supply shortages from the DRC, where right now we're in something completely different. It's demand pull coming from the battery sector, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. This project has the ultimate in uh, byproduct. Here's where Pierre and I completely agree. We have over a million ounces of gold in our deposit in the mineral reserve. That's a highly liquid co-product that is counter-cyclical and uh, also uh, convertible into cash virtually at any time. We also have 12% of global bismuth reserves. I won't uh, comment too much on the bismuth other than its principal usage is in the automotive industry for windshield fritz to protect the windshield seal from being degraded from UV radiation. German cars are electroplated in a bath of an alloy containing bismuth. Uh, pearlescent paints are generated with uh, pearly luster coming from, uh, from bismuth. Uh, also, uh, some paint pigments, it's in Pepto-Bismol, which demonstrates that it's ingestible, environmentally very safe, and the future use, sorry, is in, uh, is in uh, replacement for lead in, in potable drinking water sources, for solders, 
for uh, brasses. Also, the European Union has banned the use of lead in electronics and other consumer goods. Um, now I'm going to start talking about our project. It's comprised of two sites. So the mine and the concentrator is in the Northwest Territories near, uh, near Yellowknife. Uh, we are, are going to build our, our refinery in Saskatoon. And the most important economic attribute to this project has to be understood right here. We have a very high concentration ratio. So when we subject our ores to very simple crush grind flotation processes, we concentrate all the valuable metals in only 3.6% of the original mass. So when we do our downstream more expensive processing, it's happening on only 3.6% of the original mass. So if we compare to a laterite of similar grade, they're doing all of the processing on the entire ore, where we're only doing it on 1 23rd of the similar volume in the, in the ore. Um, basically, uh, uh, we um, uh, transport our materials through, through trucking and then rail uh, through to, to Saskatoon. The government of the Northwest Territories, as well as the government of Canada, are funding a new road called the Tlicho Road to the community of Wati. That has just uh, cleared the environmental assessment process. It's uh, for the minister now for approval. And uh, uh, ex construction is expected to, to start next year under a P3 financing uh, uh, structure with the federal government contributing 25% to the P3, which is being managed by the government of the Northwest Territories. We're, um, uh, we're also going to build a 49 kilometer access road to the site, which uh, was, is covered under our environmental assessment process, as well as the feasibility study that we've already done and are updating currently. We're also in the, the Tlicho settled land claim area. That's a very important thing to identify that uh, the Tlicho have been very supportive of mining and have participated uh, uh, in mining through the diamond industry in, in the Northwest Territories for about a decade now. Our project's an IOCG. What's an IOCG? Well, Olympic Dam is the, uh, is the largest example of that class and is about 7 billion tons in, uh, in uh, mineral reserves. A typical IOCG is over a billion tons of reserves. The geophysical anomalies associated with the deposit are 15 to 20 square kilometers in size. And the simple uh, point I'm trying to get across here is that we have a 33 million ton reserve, which is growing in the new feasibility study. We have a satellite 10 million, taller, 10 million ton copper deposit, and we will find more ore on this project. The um, ore is beautifully configured in nice, uh, gently dipping stratavound lenses. Each one of those lenses up to 70 meters in true thickness, so we have combined mining width is well over 100 meters, beautifully amenable to low cost open pit mining. We also do a little bit of underground mining, which is targeting some high-grade gold actually contained within the pit shell, and that's just cash flow scheduling, accelerating the, uh, the payback by mining some high-margin material by underground methods during the first two years in combination with open pit. Mineral reserves are 33 million tons, containing 1.1 million ounces gold, 82 million pounds of cobalt, 102 million tons, uh, pounds of, of uh, bismuth and 27 million uh, pounds of, uh, of copper. These reserves will be roughly 30% larger in the new feasibility study coming out in June. We've test mined it. So we've validated the geometry, the grade, and the mining conditions. We've collected large samples for verification of the process flow sheet, the recoveries, as well as the, uh, the product quality, because we've produced cobalt sulfate and shipped it to battery producers around the world and we've done feed engineering and third-party due diligence on the project. Uh, just a quick shot of the mine plan. It's uh, primarily open pit mining. We dry stack our tails in combination with, uh, with our waste rock. Uh, most of those others, uh, sort of figures between the plant there, are, are stockpiles. The refinery in Saskatoon has low-cost power, 7.1 cents per kilowatt hour. We mitigate our risk to staff turnover with a commutable labor pool. Proximity to reagents and services for downstream processing, a five-year tax holiday with the Saskatchewan government. But very importantly, we um, also, having this location in southern Canada, this facility will be able to process other ores from smaller deposits that cannot pay the cost of building a downstream refinery. We also plan to diversify into the recycling business as that opportunity becomes available in the future. 
feasibility study, unfortunately, is outdated. This was done in 2014 at $16 cobalt. Today's cobalt price is $40. The, the Canadian dollar was 88 cents in 2014. Today it's 78 cents. Unfortunately, our business price is a little off, but other, the other commodities are, are um, still very attractive. This generated a 15% internal rate of return, $250 million NPV, but the cycle price is more indicative of what we're expecting in the updated feasibility with 20% internal rates of return and over a half a billion in NPV. And the margins, which were 50%, and $100 million in annual EBITDA are expected to be significantly higher, reflecting the higher cobalt price. Um, the new feasibility study, I think I've talked about most of the opportunities that are coming out with that uh, study. Uh, we work with, with companies that have, are highly respected in the mining uh, industry. We've already talked about Hatch, Micon, and, and uh, p and &E that are doing the updated feasibility study, but everybody that works on the project is highly respected. Excellent relationships with our Aboriginal partners, the Tlicho government. We have a 20-year history of engagement with the Tlicho, as well as the uh, Northwest Territories government. And we have a strategic process underway right now to identify uh, partners that will probably be coming from either the automotive sector or the battery uh, business, but could also come from technologies like Apple or Google that are looking for a Canadian vertically integrated source of supply with supply chain transparency and custody control of product. Um, I won't go into any details because I think I'm out of time, <laughs> but uh, we do have a team that have, have proven records building and operating mines. Our chief operating officer just finished building the Gauchakwe Diamond Mine in the Northwest Territories two years ago when he was chief operating officer De Beers, and our chief financial officer was uh, uh, the former CFO of, De of BHP Billet and Diamonds and also De Beers Canada. So we have a team that has proven abilities in execution and delivery of projects in a not so, uh, uh, in a difficult place to, to, to work in the Northwest Territories. So I thank you very much for coming out to, to uh, hear this presentation. And uh, thanks. <laughs> sorry if I went over. <laughs>